Well, hello and, and welcome everybody to another OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm really pleased today to have with us um, Jeff McCormick and Paul Lawrence from Crunchy Data. And we've got a, an interesting talk. Um, it's one of our favorite databases and um, to work with. And now that it's running up and wonderfully with uh, OpenShift 3 and in containers and Kubernetes, we thought we'd have Crunchy Data folks to come and talk about how they made it work so wonderfully, um, and to do some um, background on how to use Postgres with OpenShift as well. So with that, I'm going to let Jeff um, introduce himself and his team. If you have questions um, during the presentation, ask them in the chat, and um, after the presentation and the, and the demo is done, we'll, um, we'll open it up for Q&A. And there's a couple of other technical folks from Crunchy online, so they may get answered in the chat, but we'll try and reiterate them for the recording as well. So without further ado, Jeff, why don't you take it away? Yeah, well, thank you, Diane. Um, we're happy to present this material. Paul Lawrence uh, is gonna kick it off and give you a background on kind of Crunchy and what we do. Um, and then I will pick it up with um, a demo and talk about some of the technology bits here. Paul, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. This is Paul Lawrence with Crunchy Data. And so Crunchy Data is a provider of trusted open source Postgres and Postgres support and technology. And we've been working with the Red Hat OpenShift team for about two years now, uh, initially in version two. And then uh, when, the, when the migration went to version three, uh, and all good things with Docker and Kube, the Kubernetes, we, we kind of jumped on board and have been working with them since, specifically to bring uh, enterprise Postgres capability to to the OpenShift platform. And have been doing a lot of interesting stuff there that we're, we're excited to show uh, the Commons group today. On the, uh, at its core, uh, Crunchy Data has a distribution of Postgres called Crunchy Certified Postgres. It's 100% open source. Uh, uh, unmodified Postgres 9.5 in, included in our distribution is PostGIS uh, to support geospatial data types, as well as uh, enhanced audit logging capability through an open source project called PG Audit. And then we also have uh, an advanced SE Linux integration uh, as an extension to Postgres that uh, enables multi-level security. And this is again, all 100% open source and as noted in the bottom yeah, in evaluation for common criteria certification. What we've been doing with OpenShift is bringing not just Postgres, but extending uh, Postgres with a, an integration into, into OpenShift, as well as providing some tools and utilities that really provide kind of a Postgres as a service experience on the, on the OpenShift platform. And as Jeff will talk about here in a second, we've done that through a series of additional containers that we've developed. So not only do you have a Postgres database, but you have the kinds of enterprise capabilities that you'd expect, like high availability, backup or store, uh, failover, monitoring, and some other DBA utilities. And so, um, Jeff, with that, do you want to kind of take folks through through the various pieces to, to what we've done here? Sure. So um, what I'll do is take you through the containers, give you a description of those, and then at the end of this, I'll uh, uh, show you some of the demo material and uh, some of the screens that are part of that. So, um, but first of all, just a background, the number one container we started with was just taking Postgres uh, and putting it inside a container um, and using that as kind of the foundation. So what we have is a container, base container called Crunchy Postgres. It includes uh, Postgres 9.5. We also have a 9.3 version and can spin up other versions uh, depending on what a customer needs. But that's the main container that runs our, our Postgres. Um, and when we do a restore job, we're basically uh, spinning up that database container. So a lot of the other containers I'll talk about are all interacting or dealing with management uh, or monitoring of these Postgres containers. And whenever we create a Postgres um, cluster or master slave, it's all basically just this crunchy Postgres container. So uh, that's a good place to start. Um, one of the first things I noticed was we I, I wanted to kind of have an ecosystem of containers 
around Postgres after um, kind of figuring out OpenShift and Kubernetes and how to make make this work. So one of the very first things uh, I wanted to be able to create a, a, a full ba backup of one of these database containers and created a container called Crunchy Backup that literally just runs a PG based backup, which is a full database backup against a running database container. And the diagram at the bottom kind of shows you some of the major pieces of that. And you execute a backup container. It literally runs as a Kubernetes job, which is kind of a, a one time only execution of a container. And it performs this backup against a a running database Postgres container, and it takes the backup archive files and stores them off on an NFS uh, volume so that you always can go back and have a persisted copy of your backup. So when you look at the examples we do or ship with the, with these containers, you'll see a whole bunch of um, persistent volumes and per persistent volume claims that get built and used whenever you do these backups. Uh, the examples that I ship all use NFS, but you could certainly translate that into Ceph or Gluster or some other storage capability. And the Cube um, OpenShift guys did, I think, a good job of uh, abstracting that choice away. So it's pretty easy and straightforward to switch from NFS to Gluster uh, with not a lot of lot of changes. Now, right after I did backup, obviously, I wanted to figure out a way to do restore from one of those backups. And that's really performed by that same crunchy Postgres container. And just by passing in a backup path uh, into that container, the Postgres container, uh, and passing some other flags, environment variables, it's enough to tell it to, hey, I want to do a restore, and I'm, I'm going to pull from this um, particular backup path, which is a kind of a timestamp directory structure. Um, it'll read uh, the archive files basically off of NFS, pull those into the running Postgres container, and it it um, uses rsync for that. So it's basically doing an rsync uh, from that NFS uh, path back into the container. So that's one way to do a backup and restore that I have today. Uh, some other containers. One is called Crunchy PG Badger, and uh, I was asked by a, a DBA if I could run PG Badger against, which is kind of an analytical Postgres log analysis tool, pretty good one that a lot of people are, use in the Postgres community. So, um, yeah, what, what PG Badger does is it has to read the log files from Postgres. So I created a container that if you drop it inside a pod with a, a Postgres container, it basically uh, lets PG Badger read those log files through a shared volume mount because it's inside a, a pod. You, you're able to do that sort of thing. And I wrapped a PG Badger with an HTTP uh, uh, wrapper essentially around it so that you can do um, web calls basically to PG Badger, you can execute it and it'll spit back a uh, HTML report. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute, but that's a case where I'm leveraging the uh, kind of unique nature of, of what a pod uh, lets you do by combining a bunch of containers together. Um, I'll give you an example of that here in a second, but that's a, a Postgres utility that's been out there a long time. It's written in Perl, I think it's mostly a command line tool, but um, by containerizing it and wrapping it with a, a little bit of a web container, um, I think it adds some some value. Crunchy PG Pool is another case where I take I've taken a a pretty widely known Postgres um, clustering utility and wrapped it inside a container. And what PG Pool basically does is lets you proxy um, 
Postgres connections from like, let's say you have a master and a slave connection, um, PG pool will set in front of those running as a standalone container. And if your application connects to that PG pool container, it looks like you have just one single connection to your application, but PG pool is actually managing uh, two separate connections internally, and it's sending SQL inserts to the master and it's sending, sending selects to the slave. So it knows kind of where to direct certain types of SQL statements. And it's, it's kind of a nice utility for apps that uh, really just want to manage a single entry point into a cluster as opposed to managing separate uh, connections to a cluster. So in Postgres, a master is read-write, and slaves are read only. So that's the distinguishing uh, characteristic there. And that's really the value I'm getting out of PG Pool today is that unique feature. PG Pool lets you do a lot of other things. And I may expose those features in that container uh, over the coming months. Crunchy Watch is a container that really right now is the starting point for performing automated failover. So what Crunchy Watch does is looks at a master when it's running, and that's just a Postgres node. And it basically just pings it, uses a um, Postgres uh, command called PG is ready to just basically look at the master and do a health check on it every configurable like i think the default is like every 20 seconds it'll just sit there and ping it if the master goes down uh, what crunchy watch does is it uh, attempts to perform a failover on one of the slaves and it will perform the slave uh, or it'll, it'll trigger the, the failover on a slave and it changes actually the um, kubernetes labels on that slave to become a master and at that point, when that slave becomes a master, Kubernetes will spin up another slave to keep the uh, number of replicas um, in sync with the definition that you've given. And it's kind of a, a complicated subject, and I could talk probably just about an hour on why this is just the starting point of an automated failover strategy. But what I'll suffice to say, it's it's a, a simple way to at least keep your your cluster up and running in the event that you lose a master. Um, another container is called Crunchy Collect. And this gets into the idea of wanting to collect me Postgres metrics from all of your database containers. Um, Metrics that are specific to Postgres in particular are the ones that I've targeted initially. So uh, there's lots of different Postgres monitoring tools out there, and I just basically pick some some basic one metrics that, that people are familiar with. And the, the purpose of Crunchy Collect is to collect those metrics from a running Postgres container and then pushes them off to a Prometheus time series data store for storage and retrieval. Um, and that occurs on a frequency as well that's configurable. So if you have a database uh, that you want to collect metrics from, you basically would just take this crunchy collect container, add it into the pod that your database is running, and it will automatically begin collection of those metrics and pushing them out basically. Uh, again, it's another example where I'm leveraging that capability of a pod to have multiple containers in it. Crunchy Grafana is part of this metrics collection in that it uh, gives you a graphical uh, dashboard capability to uh, graph those collected metrics and push them out into a web app. And I'll give you a demonstration of that here in a minute. Crunchy Prometheus is the data store that I chose for storing these metrics. Um, there's other data stores out there, but <laughs> Prometheus, uh, I've had good experience with it so far, and it really works, I think, well for this, this kind of um, problem to solve. Um, it's nothing but, this Crunchy Prometheus is nothing but a wrapper around the Prometheus database. 
Um, my base images run typically on RHEL 7 base images. So this is Prometheus running on a RHEL 7 base image. And it has a volume mount so that you can obviously mount the, the data uh, out to some NFS or whatever persistent storage you want to use. Crunchy Gateway is literally just a piece of um, Prometheus that they have, which is a push gateway. So it enables Crunchy Collect to actually push metrics to this gateway. And then Prometheus scrapes or pulls those metrics from this gateway. So it's kind of a bridge in between um, Collect uh, containers and the Prometheus backend. This is a diagram that shows all of those components and kind of how they're mapped out and what's going on. To the left, you see the pod that contains both the Postgres container and the collection container. The collection container is pushing to the gateway. Prometheus containers out there scraping that gateway and pulling metrics, storing them in the its data store. And then Grafana is simply just a client to Prometheus pulling those metrics. Uh, moving on, there's um, another task other than just backups that a DBA would do. A DBA might want to perform um, Postgres vacuums on um, either databases, uh, the entire databases are tables in specific tables. And so what I did is I wrote a container that's just nothing but a Postgres vacuum. And whenever you run that container as a job, uh, it's a one-off execution of that job. And it, you can configure that job through environment variables to do various types of vacuum analyze uh, on either a full database or on a specific um, table as well. So uh, very small microservice type of DBA related task that is an example again of something that routinely people would want to do against a, a production level database. So I started with backup job and vacuum job was a second to that. And then I, I was asked by another client, well, obviously we would like to be able to schedule these things and we don't really want to get into cron schedulers on the Linux host themselves. We want to have a containerized way to execute and schedule these backup and vacuum jobs. So I created a, another container called Crunchy DBA, um, which has a one-to-one -one relationship with some database container. Uh, and that DBA container is a cron scheduler and that just sets out there and says, uh, what frequency do I want to do these various DBA related tasks? Now, the ones it understands today that you can schedule are backup jobs and vacuum jobs. But I wanted to point out that you, if let's say you have 10 Postgres containers, you would in this case attach, you know, 10 DBAs essentially to it. So it's designed right now where there is a one-to-one a -one relationship between these two. So it's kind of like a dedicated DBA <laughs> being attached to your database and its job is just to kind of do these routine tasks. So. Um, that's the structure which I've set up here. And I would envision customers using this to write their own DBA uh, jobs and just using backup and vacuum as kind of like examples that they could write, you know, their own custom backup jobs. And then there's just a very little bit of integration they have to do in the DBA container to be able to schedule those things out. So, when I talk about a Postgres kind of container ecosystem, this is really uh, a good example of that where we are trying to containerize uh, all the things that we think would be useful to containerize around that Postgres container so that you can do, um, you know, management, help, uh, and, and kind of the management of your Postgres environment. So, in order to do all this, um, what kind of OpenShift concepts did I run into and really need to do this? So I've, you've ta I've talked about uh, the Kubernetes job. Um, that's a um, relatively new thing where it's a one-time batch execution, almost like a batch job that you're executing. And so I create these jobs um, on the dynamically within that crunchy DBA container to go off and create and fire up these backup and vacuum tasks. 
Well, that's a part of that Kubernetes. Uh, I'm using Kubernetes jobs essentially to do that. And then in order to be able to dynamically create things from uh, uh, Kubernetes objects from within a container, that's where I'm using service accounts. So if you look at uh, an OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes, how service accounts work, I'm setting up a service account so that I can execute um, OC commands from within that container. And uh, I'm using that in two situations. One is Crunchy DBA to spin up and create new jobs. And then I'm also using it in the automated failover Crunchy Watch container to go out and uh, touch files in the slaves um, within that slave container and also to change the label on a, um, a slave pod from a slave to a master. So that's where service accounts are vital in, able to be, in order to be able to do that kind of uh, uh, internal um, API type work. NFS volumes are used for backups and restores. Um, again, I could switch that out with Ceph or Gluster, but the key there is uh, I need persistent storage for holding backups. And um, it's, um, vital to have that because you, it just wouldn't make sense to to have at any other you know non-persistent backup type mechanism now i can use nfs volumes or choose not to use nfs volumes to run my postgres on and that's a key point um, but it it's up to you if you want to run postgres not using persistent volumes to manage uh, you know, doing backups and being able to withstand losing your, your database. But if you do use like empty dir volumes, you do get a, a nice performance increase of using local IO as opposed to network. So you as the deployer of this technology, um, you know, you want to really uh, think about your use case and uh, whether you, what types of volumes you want to use. And we could do an entire talk just on that subject. And uh, we've learned, I've, I've learned a lot about, um, I guess, the hard way of how to deal with volume management. Um, but I give you the option in a lot of the different examples of running these containers of using either NFS volumes or empty dir volumes. And if you were to look at the examples that I ship with it, you'll see a, uh, where I make, make reference to that. Um, now, where are we going with this? There's a whole lot of containers that have kind of exploded here, um, but there's probably five or six more uh, on our roadmap to do um, in the next coming months. And they're all Postgres related microservices that either help or, or augment uh, kind of the experience of uh, managing groups of Postgres uh, containers and clusters. So there's a whole bunch of different types of tasks that that I, we envision adding to help a DBA manage this and monitor. And then there's a, a several more Postgres utilities that we think would be useful to wrap as containers and add in here so that, uh, again, you have lots more uh, the goal here is to bring in a lot of, of more valuable Postgres utilities into this container infrastructure. And uh, like I say, there's already five or six that we kind of have queued up to do. Now, if you have questions uh, about any of this, uh, you know, our email addresses are, are posted there at the bottom um, and also our website and then the GitHub. Now, GitHub's marked private now but we're about to release this so at some point that's going to go public but that's the uh, where everything is at in the github so let me switch over i'll show you a few screens uh, for demos and i think we're on target time wise yes indeed excellent so i talked about grafana this is grafana it's a pretty nice web um, application that uh, lets you graph uh, and create dashboards of 
of different kinds of collected metrics. And I am no Grafana expert, but this is, will at least give you an example um, of what you can do. And this particular dashboard graph that I've got here is showing, you know, one metric on one database. And it's essentially the number of connections over time. And I've been uh, doing a few tests this morning and running different connections on this. And it's it just a one really simple way to, to be able to graph. And I could add more metrics over this if I wanted to just by uh, selecting you know, another adding another query in here. These crunchy underscore metrics are all of the collected metrics that we pull. And I think there's like 30 or 32 of them. Um, depending on how you've exercised your database, some of these have values, some of them uh, you really need to run some load against in order to get um, something to show up. Like that's a good example of a metric that I'm just not exercising. But it is also an example where you can combine metrics on a single um, graph. And Grafana lets you build a number of different dashboards with multiple graphs on it. And again, I could go off the deep end, I guess, and talk for hours on Grafana, but um, that's another obviously another session behind that is prometheus prometheus is really gives you a very simplistic graphing and query console um, i go ahead and expose that because it's a nice utility just for people to do but this is a very similar graph of that same connection metric but it's through the prometheus dashboard um, but that's a good way to test your metrics that you're collecting from a a base raw level to say, well, is it even stored in my in my Prometheus database? And yes, it is. That's a this tab is that gateway, and that just shows you the collected metrics, and you can drill down into those metric values here as well, and it'll show you metadata. Probably you would never use this other than just if you're debugging your setup, but it is out there, and you can. Um, kind of poke down into individual metrics as they're being queued up and collected. Um, PG Badger, this is the output of the PG Badger uh, container. And, you know, this is a very interesting utility and I can see why DBAs like it because it packs a tremendous amount of uh, log analysis into one single web page. And you'll see up here in the URL, that's the HTTP wrapper that I've placed around it, uh, this utility. So when I execute this uh, um, URL, it basically comes back with this. But this is a, a really uh, pretty nice for you know a free open source utility. It gives you a tremendous amount of, of information in a small area. Um, and with that, I will show you a, um, a brief, one second. You can see my screen. Um, just, this is gonna be hard to read probably, um, and it certainly command line stuff doesn't demo particularly well, but I will show you um, a few things of interest from the command line. So I mentioned a vacuum job. I wanted to show you basically, if you say OC git job, um, a lot of folks aren't familiar with jobs and they've never run OC git job. You know, they're, they're not building jobs, but it's pretty nice. And uh, with a job, there's an associated um, pod. Uh, so if you do, if you look here, this is the associated pod with this job, okay? So if you look at the output of that vacuum job, you will see that it's really nothing but the output of a, a normal Postgres vacuum SQL statement. Um, but that gives you an example, a little bit of, of how jobs look and, and work. And it's, it, it's, it's really, you know, kind of a microservice, very narrowly focused, uh, it does one thing and that's it. You know, that's kind of the, the goal of these DBA tasks. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is just some of you aren't, have not seen um, how to scale up things. Um, 
let me show you how that works. So I've got a master slave out there running. And basically, if I issue this OC scale RC command like this with replic is equals two, um, it's basically going to tell um, Kubernetes and OpenShift, hey, I want two slaves instead of just one. Uh, and that's a very simple way to manually scale up a, a cluster. And you'll see here these three lines right here. That I've got one master and then I've got two slaves. And that master is replicating to those two slaves. And you can just continually scale up um, these kind of Postgres configurations like this using uh, that OC scale command. Uh, something I don't have to demo today, but I will in the future is, is really where based on uh, CPU load, Kubernetes can uh, actually perform that scale up for you. And that's something I'm working on, but not quite ready to show that yet. And some people may want to be a little bit more have their DevOps in, in control of that scale up and, and scale down as well. But that's really as simple as it can, um, you can also do that scale up command through the web console as well. There's like an up arrow and you just click on that and it executes that OC scale command. But that's really, um, I think what I have to show today, uh, given the, the time that we have. So uh, I guess at this point I would uh, open it up for, um, Q and A if there's if there's questions. Yeah, thank you very much. That was actually quite amazing to see all of those different pieces and parts uh, containerized and, uh, and available. Um, there is one question. Um, Diego Castro from GetUp Cloud is asking. Um, he said he's first. He states there is no scheduler jobs in OpenShift. How do you manage Crunchy DBA running as Chrome? And he uh, would just like you to dive a little deeper in how that all yeah. works. Yeah. I'll, I'll unmute him so he can ask questions to follow up. Sure, sure, I can explain that. So Crunchy DBA executes a Golang version of Cron inside it, okay? So it's not hooked into any external scheduler, uh, either on the Linux host or within OpenShift at all. It's actually taking a, a open source version of, of Cron, again, written in Golang, uh, just because I code in Golang, and it's actually executing that, okay? So when you run Crunchy DBA, it actually starts up a, a, a Cron scheduler inside the container, and it's using that um, scheduler inside the container. So it's all self-contained. It has no hooks into anything outside to uh, fire off those. And it's, and it's doing really just two things today. It's looking for the scheduled vacuum jobs and it's also looking for scheduled backup jobs. Um, and um, you interact with Crunchy DBA through environment variables. There's an environment variable. Let me see if I can uh, show you an example real quick of that. Sorry. You can still see my screen, but there's an environment variable uh, you'll see uh, called backup schedule. And uh, the value you pass into it is literally a, a cron um, exp you know, expression. And it's, it supports all the valid cron expressions, interestingly, as well. It's pretty full cron implementation. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank Very you. Very good. Well, Diego, you, you had another one regarding the backups? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how do we manage the backups? Are they PG dump or binary backups? Yeah, um, great question. Today, the backup that I have implemented executes PG-based backup. So it's actually just executing a PG-based backup against your database. And it's doing a full uh, 
just a full database backup. So yeah, I don't use PG Dump currently. Um, that's a good question though, because what I'd like to do is be able to support uh, some kind of incremental backup, and that's a, a definitely on the roadmap. I'm looking to be able to execute incremental backup jobs against, say, you know, very large databases where uh, PG dump or PG based backup wouldn't wouldn't be what you would need. So uh, that's in the works, and it's literally uh, high on my priority is to implement some form of an incremental backup. Looking for the right solution there, it's probably going maybe uh, PG backrest or or something similar to that. Looks very promising. So uh, great question though. Okay, thank you. So I know um, you're using NFS, um, and Diego, I'm pretty sure you guys are using Ceph, so it sounded like you could use, you could switch off pretty easily, um, or there would be some work, but it's not impossible to do. That would be interesting to see this done again on Ceph. Yeah. Are there yeah. other questions out there right now? Um, has one? So our, uh, I'm going to ask one. You put a link up earlier to your GitHub repo that's private. Um, the containers are, are they the containers there or the templates there? Um, and where are you hosting the images themselves? Are they yeah. where, where will they be available? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, our work. And one reason why we're still kind of working on this is is exactly how to release it. So, you know, one thing we're considering doing is putting these on a private for for like enterprise customers that want you know paid support. What we'll probably end up doing is putting them on a private Docker repo that we host, and only you know enterprise customers would have you know, access to that repo and they'd be able to pull down pre-built images. Mm -hmm. uh, now in the GitHub, um, you would have access to all the Docker files uh, and you'd be able to build all of the images yourself directly on your infrastructure if you did not want to pull down pre-built images. The pre-built images we will probably build will be RHEL 7 base images, for example with uh, the crunchy version or, or crunchy built Postgres uh, uh, 9.5 in it. Now, in the GitHub, you will see there's other options uh, of what base images and what versions of Postgres that you want to build into your containers. So I've tried to abstract those kinds of things out into just build um, environment kind of configuration options, but the public versions of these will probably, of these containers um, would like, perhaps they'll be based on CentOS as the base image. Those would probably be hosted just out on Docker Hub. So when you, uh, when, when we make an official release of this, you'll probably see these in two separate places, but Paul, you may want to jump in and clarify that. <laughs> there we go. We muted Bob Lawrence, so yeah. Just so you know, I think that was the one that popped open there. <laughs> but anyway, um, stay tuned. We're going to make some uh, releases of this and announcements. Um, and there's some things we're working on with making a lot of this stuff available out there. And like the OpenShift dedicated is something that that we're seriously looking at. So we're going to make. Um, a lot of this technology available, just pure open source, free for everybody. And then there's going to be some ways in which you can get this uh, from like a paid subscription model um, or as, or something like OpenShift Dedicated is something we've actively been uh, working with Red Hat on. So, um, you know, we're anticipating here pretty shortly, like I say, Q2 of this year to have this ready for people to pull down and consume. and there's five or six more containers. I'm trying to put as much in here as I can before we release it. But what I also want to do is make sure that it's uh, documented to, you know, to a standard that everybody's going to expect and, you know, full suite of tests and hooked into, you know, uh, the CI builds system that, you know, that, we'll, that we have as well. So there's still a few more things that I'm tweaking and tuning before we, uh, we put it out there for everybody, but um, 
uh, I also wanted to put this out here now and get a little early feedback to help us kind of tune and tailor our roadmap going forward uh, as well. But I see this growing again as a as an ecosystem of of containers and microservices that for people wanting to run Postgres, you know, OpenShift Postgres on it or Postgres in an OpenShift, you know, container environment. We're trying to give them really uh, a lot of tools at their, um, you know, at their fingertips, as opposed to just giving them a container and saying, well, good luck, you know. So we're going to try to automate a lot of tasks and we're going to try to do it in a real OpenShift container uh, way. And that's kind of our, our philosophy with this. So um, any other questions? I don't see any right now, but I actually think that this is this has really been very good um, and very insightful. I think the way that you wrap things up in the tooling into containers is really helpful for people to see. I mean, there's a lot of other folks out there who are um, trying to do similar things with their databases and their service offerings. And um, you know, usually we do see someone just create a container with just the database in it and not really. Um, anticipating the need for all the tooling. And this is very um, well thought out, so much appreciated. Can, um, I know this was, there were a lot of uh, probably interesting war wounds and things like that learning in the learning curve to Kubernetes. What was the biggest surprise or the biggest learning that you had to do around um, a Kubernetes-based um, containerized process like this? What was, if someone was yeah. Yeah, good questions uh, for sure. I started on this probably um, really early. Uh, I mean, probably like almost two years ago, uh, right as, right as the, the Docker uh, technology was kind of chosen for the next generation of OpenShift. So I started out, you know, pre, like really early with Kubernetes. So uh, I was watching and testing the growth of Kubernetes and, and OpenShift to to see, you know, how could I how could I implement some of these things I wanted to do. And you know, a year and a half ago, two years ago, it wasn't possible. There was not things there like service accounts that enabled me to do a lot of uh, of this really low level integration and dynamics stuff you know it was all very manual a year and a half ago so and then i kind of went through uh, have needing volume management and saw that kind of evolve as well so volume management right now is is really um working good enough and well enough for us to do some of this database related stuff we think where people could deploy it you know really solidly as well so uh, service accounts, the development of that, the, the, the maturing of, of things like the job concept where you have a one-time thing you want to execute, that's been really helpful. Um, and then the service accounts, jobs, volume management, all those things have really made it possible to go ahead and add a bunch of these features in there. Now, um, somebody asked a question here that says, could other database systems kind of do some of these these same patterns and yeah i would think so um you know I, to me it's just logical that if you have a database in a in a particular deployment model like this of containers that you would want to try to get those same advantages of running a database in a container from some of the you know all of the task around managing and, and keeping a database healthy so uh, to me, there's some of these patterns and some of the diagrams I put in here specifically are very, you're gonna see those same patterns in other, in other databases. And I was asked the same question from another, uh, for another company that was doing something similar. Um, and yeah, I, I would see databases in OpenShift working a lot like this, where not only do you get a base container, but you get a, a lot of stuff around it that helps you kind of treat it as a database as a service. Yeah, so things like building a web user interface uh, that helps you manage all of these database containers. I mean, that's something definitely that we're thinking about doing because if I deploy and spin up say 50 databases and have them all out there, now I'm gonna be looking for tools that manage you know, that entire you know, collection of, of database containers in some smart way. 
And I think that all the tools that are now there in OpenShift uh, and Kubernetes that allow you to to do pretty much anything that you can think of, you know. Uh, I think, you know, long term, there's I'm looking for more advances on the volume management side that might make life a little easier as well. But uh, right now, I do think you could you could deploy it and uh, be successful with it the way it works. So. A whole lot of work has gone into this, and it's really much appreciated, Jeff and Paul. Okay. Thank you very much for this effort, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing a number of other database systems come into this containerized pattern um, not in the not too distant future, too. So I think um, this is really the crux of why OpenShift Commons is, is such a, um, a, a nice peer-to-peer -peer network, because we're able to share these lessons learned and um, inform each other. And this has really been a very good example of that. So thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. Thank you, Diane. I don't see any other questions. Um, I will share this um, recording out um, through the mailing list and on the website shortly. And um, we'll be up next week with some a talk by Google on Kubernetes, the future and the present, and the upcoming roadmap for that. So that's a, be a good one to look forward to next week. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll talk to you all soon.